Good morning. It's good to see everybody. I am want to express my gratitude for um, for Emory for filling in for me last uh, weekend. I know that's uh, it's a lot to ask of him, but he was willing and able, and uh, heard lots of good things um, from from his lessons. And very grateful for his willingness and ability to do that. So thank you, Emory, for doing that. And uh, it, it's good to be back. It's good to be home. Uh, we, we got to travel a little bit and got to see the family some. And uh, it's, it's always good to come home and, and kind of get, get back into the, the normal everyday routine. So this is a new year. We're starting a new year, believe it or not. Um, we are also starting our, our yearly Bible reading over again. Of course, we're reading the same book, so um, mainly the same um, weekly schedule that we had last year. But uh, we encourage you to pick up one of those if you haven't. They will also be in the, in the bulletin each week, the, um, uh, the, the book and the chapters that we'll be looking at. So I encourage you all to, to read and uh, read your Bible. Commit to that. Read your Bible this year. It'll be encouraging to you. I also wanted to remind you that Wednesdays we are going full steam into our LTC. And so we will be having our meals on Wednesday as we did um, in the past. And so just kind of keep that in mind and look forward to that. The LTC kids will be doing the book of Genesis this year. And so that's going to be super exciting for them and exciting for us as well. And so since they were doing the book of Genesis, I decided that we will do a, a similar theme for our year. We're going to do a theme that is entitled New Beginnings. And we'll spend a decent amount of time in Genesis, but that's where I'm going to be receiving most of my outlines for the sermon series that we'll be coming up with during the year. So it's very exciting. We'll spend some time there and, and talking about new beginnings. I'm very excited uh, for this new year. I see lots of good things coming. A lot of things, good things have already happened. And I'm very hopeful uh, that good things will continue to happen as we move through the year. You know, these these times of our our lives, these new times, I mean, we've obviously go through them frequently and we have new years that come and go. And, but it's during this this time, this this new beginning of, of a new year that we begin to reflect on the past year. And we begin to ask ourselves some questions about what we may do differently or what we might um, be wanting to do for the future. What does this year uh, have in store for us. And a lot of times we, we think about change. We want to make some changes. We want to do things a little differently. Um, how will this year be different than last? What kind of things uh, are going to happen this year? And we try to anticipate those things and we try to think about them. Uh, but I was also, and I probably mention this every year, but we're, maybe it's just because it's, it's personal. Um, we become very cynical when we talk about New Year resolutions, right? Because most of us have habits or have had a habit of not following through with those New Year resolutions. So we, we tend to be a little cynical when it comes to those kinds of things. Um, we have a track record of not keeping those. And I'm not saying that's a, uh, not prophesying that or saying that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it happens and we tend to do that. And we become very discouraged when those things happen. And I think there are a few reasons why we, we tend to not follow through with things that we resolve to change for the year. And one of those is that old habits die hard. It's just really, really hard to change old um, habits. But I think the other thing, and maybe this is more so uh, than the first, is that we don't consider the reward worth the sacrifice. We get into it and we think, yes, I'm going to do it. And yes, it's important to me. But, but after a while, when, when things get a little tough or life starts to happen or things become busy, um, usually about mid-February, we, we begin to think, you know, the, the reward is just not worth the sacrifice. And we lose focus on those, on those things. We don't consider the reward worth the sacrifice, right? If I'm going to give up something that, that I enjoy, something that's comfortable to me, something that, that I like, right, to achieve a goal, to, to receive a reward for that sacrifice, then that sacrifice has to be worth it. Agreed? We, we have to really consider the sacrifice worth 
worth the reward that is coming to us. And also, we have to consider the reward obtainable. You know, if we look at it and we say, well, yeah, it's a nice hope, you know, I mean, that's a good wish and all, but it's never going to happen. There's no way that we're going to commit ourselves to sacrifice the things that we are comfortable with because we don't believe the reward is obtainable. We don't think it's possible. So, so we quit before we even begin because of these kinds of things. Now, this is obviously true in our daily lives. This is true in our everyday wake up in the morning, go to work, make commitments, set goals, that kind of a lifestyle. It's true when we talk about things like, I want to eat better. You know, I just, I want to, I want to have better eating habits and we commit to that for the year. Or I want to, I want to exercise more. Now, I don't know if anybody actually has ever said that. Um, I don't really want to exercise more, but, uh, but I know that it, it is beneficial. So I guess, you know, there's that side of that, but we have other things like money habits and we say, you know, I, I want to have better money habits. But if, but again, if we don't consider the outcome of that worth making the necessary sacrifices, we're simply not going to do it. So here's what I want us to consider this morning for our lesson. We have to consider the reward worth the sacrifice and that the sacrifice will result in something good for the future. If, if whatever it is you've resolved to do, whether it's in your personal life, whether it is in your relationship with Jesus, whatever it is you resolve to do, these things have to be true in your mind, in your heart, before you can achieve whatever it is you set out, whatever goal it is that you have. If, if you're going to be more faithful, if you're going to be more committed, if you're going to put aside sin, right? If you're going to put aside sinful desires, if you're, if you're going to serve God, if, if you are going to do those kinds of things, we have to believe that the outcome of that, that the reward from that, that, that the goal, the purpose, the desire, the will, that all of those things are worth it, right? And of course, we would always say, yes, they're really worth it. We always say that, don't we? But, but our actions don't always say that, do they? Our mouth says it, right? I mean, we say it with our mouth. Well, yes, of course, you know, avoiding sin and being more faithful. The reward's always going to be worth it. And then what do we do? We, we don't act according to that. We say it, but we don't do it, right? Because if we truly believed that, if that was truly on our heart and on our mind, and if they were, that's the thing that we've committed to, then our action will speak for itself because we will do the very things that we believe will obtain the reward that God has in store for us. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and discuss this topic even further. Peter talks about something similar. There are brethren in the church that are struggling with these ideas, these thoughts that maybe, maybe, maybe there's no reward. Maybe there's nothing to come. Maybe what, what has been said was just hearsay. Maybe God hasn't made the promises that people claim that he has made. And, and there are people who are struggling with this idea that nothing will ever change. And, and that the world will always be the same and that things will always be the same and nothing will ever change. So if you look with me at verse verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 3, he's, Peter says, Know this first of all, that in the last days... Mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Right? I mean, really, they're living in the last days, right? Because mockers had already come and were mocking at 
those who were being faithful and making sacrifices and making commitments and, and doing things the way that God would want them to do. And there are already people there. And they weren't coming from the outside. They were coming from within inside the church. That there were people in the church who were using this kind of an excuse to not be faithful or to even give up on the pursuit of Christ altogether. They will not continue. And they're encouraging others to come and follow them, right? They're, they're wanting others to come and follow after their own desires, follow after their own lusts. And they're using this kind of an argument to persuade brethren to follow and to ignore the path that God has put for them. And so these mockers are going to quite literally point at creation and they're going to say all creation, all things have just continued exactly the way they have from the beginning, that nothing's changed, that all continues just as it has from the beginning of creation. That's their argument. Right? Look at the stability of the earth. Look at the sun and the moon and the stars. Nothing's changed. Right? And if nothing's changed, then what makes us think that anything is ever going to change? Right? What makes us think that anything is ever going to change? Why don't we just, just give in to the worldly thoughts and desires and pleasures? Because nothing's going to change. You might as well have it now. That's the kind of thinking that these people are, are promoting and these kinds of ideas. Where is the promise of his coming? Where's Jesus? If he's coming, where is he? Why doesn't he come now? Why doesn't he come tomorrow? Where is he? Where is the promise of his coming? And this is the kind of argument that is leading the brethren away. Look at verse 5. He says, for when they maintain this, Peter says, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. So, so Peter kind of throws it back at him. He, he looks at it and he says, no, now let's consider creation. All right. If, if that's the argument, if that's where we want to go with creation, it, it, it is escaping the notice of those who are trying to lead you astray that by the word of God, all things exist. All things are created, right? We, we read that in Genesis, don't we? In the beginning, right? In the beginning. God created all of these things. God put all of these things in motion. That, that, that is Peter's argument, you know? He is saying that look how things are moving along. Look how the sun comes up and the moon comes up at night to govern the skies. And look at the way the world functions. Look at how things maintain themselves and grow and how God waters the earth. And all of these things we can think about when it comes to the earth sustaining itself and life on earth being sustained and that in itself, although it seems mundane because it happens as a cycle over and over again, God is the one that put that in order. God is the one who established that and God is the one who is keeping it by his word. That is the evidence that his promises will come true. <laughs> is that God is maintaining these things. He's keeping these things. He's, he's preserving these things. That, that earth itself is evidence of God and his promise keeping. Look at verse 6. He says, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded by water. And he, Peter, once again, he says, it hasn't always been exactly like this. There was a time in history when things were a little different. But don't forget what God did by his word. Not only did he create and put things in order, but he also destroys. He also destroyed the world by water. He changed the order of things. So not only did God create it all and put it into action, but he has also changed it over time. And the false teachers have missed this. They forgot about that. They didn't realize that that very argument that they're promoting to promote their point of view is the very argument Peter's going to use to push faithfulness for the brethren in the church. Look at verse 7. He says, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Right? So the same God, once again, who created all things with his word, he destroyed the world 
by water with his word, and he can destroy the world by fire, that this God, not, not by, by some mighty force and great lengths of time and great works of power, but just simply by the power and the authority of his word can accomplish these things. Right? So when we're talking about God making a promise of Jesus' return, it, it, it stands to reason it will come to pass just based on what has happened thus far according to God's word. That God's word is solid and it's firm and it's true and it's powerful and it's authoritative and when he speaks, things come to pass. Even, even the destruction of the known world comes to pass at the spoken word of God, right? But for the time being, for the time being, all is being kept, Peter says. It's being kept by the word of God until the day of judgment, until that day the Lord does come back, right? That, that he's coming back, but God by his word is keeping all things allowing it to exist, allowing us to live, allowing the sun to come up and, and go down and the moon to rise and the stars to shine. He's, he's allowing us to live here. He, he's allowing us to exist until that day, right? It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing to think that our entire existence can change at a spoken word. Not, not just any spoken word, obviously. It is the very word of creator God. But still, just the thought of God being capable, which we all know he is, but it's still something we need to think about and meditate on. God being capable of changing everything with a word. With a word. By his authority, he can command the stars, he can command the sun, he can command the moon, he can keep everything, and he can preserve life on earth as long as he desires. Because God's word creates, right? That's what Peter has already established, and, and God's word destroys, and God's word reserves. God's word can accomplish all of these things. Look at verse 8. But he says, do not let this one fact escape your notice, Peter says, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. And the Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You see, God is not restricted by time. I think we try to bottle God up in our own mental perspective about time and days and weeks and months and things of that nature. And, and Peter wants us to remember that, that God is the creator of time, that, that that is not a restriction for him, that he's not restricted by any kind of time frame. He doesn't live within that realm in which time is important. It's important to us. Yeah, right? He created it for us, and it's important to us. And God has put markers throughout history to establish time for his people, that certain times of the year his people did certain things, and certain times throughout their life they did certain things. So God is concerned about time, but only when it relates to us. But when it comes to God himself, time is, is somewhat irrelevant in his world, but he cares about it in our world. But when we get hung up in trying to make God like us, then we've got a problem. And that seems to be one of the issues that's, that's happening during this time. But look what he says. He says, don't, don't fret, right, about this whole idea of when will Jesus come back? When will God fulfill his promises? It happens, hasn't happened yet. How long do we have to wait? So on and so forth. Those questions are irrelevant, <laughs> In reality, of course he's going to do it. Of course he's going to do it. And it's been a couple thousand years from the time that these people were making these kinds of complaints. And, and he still has not returned. But we know he will. And what Peter says about that, he says, you know what you ought to do? <laughs> you ought to consider the patience of God, your salvation. Right? Because isn't it true that every morning... 
every morning, and now I assume every one of you woke up this morning and were breathing and had a, a pulse, right? I'm pretty sure since you're here that every morning you wake up, every morning you wake up and you have breath in your lungs, right? And blood flowing through your veins. That is a new opportunity that God has gifted you every single morning that God has gifted you a new day, a new day to have life, a new day to serve Him, a new day to make the decision, if you haven't made that decision, to follow His will. It is a new day if you've made that decision and you've failed to, to be faithful to your God, to repent. And that's what Peter's saying. Peter's saying, don't, don't think about this long span of time as if God is forgetting about you, but recognize it as God's patience towards you and allowing you the opportunity to repent and do the will of the Father, that God is being patient towards you, not wishing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Folks, that's, that's amazing. Because... What has God done in the past with people? <laughs> has he not chosen to simply remove them from the earth? Has he not chosen to simply destroy the known world because of the wickedness of men? But he has also, has he not chosen to, to take the few and bring about the salvation of the many through Noah and his family? God has made these choices and he has done these things and God, by his word, could very well destroy us all and not give us the opportunity. But Peter says that is the wrong mindset. Peter says that every day when you see the sun come up, don't think it's just average and mundane. Don't think it's just another day. Don't think it's just, yeah, that's the way things have always been. Oh, no. You think about that day as the day that God has gifted to his people, to humanity in general, a new day, a new beginning to be able to start over again, to repent, to come back to God, to serve him, to do his will here on earth. We think about that in beginning of the year, don't we? It's a new year. It's a new year to be more faithful to our God, to be more committed to his teachings, to be more faithful to the kingdom purpose, to do the will of the Father. Look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come, Peter says, like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with the roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Right? So Peter is, is acknowledging that, look, this is going to happen. God said it's going to happen. We believe it's going to happen. We have creation itself to, to witness to God's faithfulness and the power of his word. We know it's going to happen, that, that the Lord will come, but it's not going to come on our time frame, or there's not going to be this long span of time where there's this warning where people can get up and say, well, you know, I've, I've got about a month. I guess I got to get my order, my, myself in order. I've got to get my life in order. No, Peter says it's going to come like a thief, right? Because isn't that how we tend to be? You know, we, we have certain goals that we set and, and we, we procrastinate because that's what we do best. And we wait 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 and we wait. And just towards the very end, we rush, 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 rush to get it all done so that when we get to that day, we've met our goal and we say, yes, I've met my goal. Because we know when that day is going to come. We know what that, when that goal is set. But Peter is saying that that's not how it will be on the day of the Lord. That's not how it will be when the Lord comes. Those people who are complaining about the fact that Jesus hasn't come back yet are wasting time. They're wasting time. Because in all reality, that day is going to be like a thief in the night, right? Because he's not going to announce his presence, you know, and say, knock on the door and say, hey, guys, uh, tomorrow night I'm going to rob your house. So just beware of that, you know. It's not how it works. But he's going to show up. He's going to show up. And for those who are looking for, for time frames and, and uh, an opportunity to say, okay, now I'm going to get my act together because the Lord's coming back next week. 
they will be sorely surprised when the Lord comes back and they're not prepared and they're not ready. And Peter says, all that time, all this time that you have right now, you consider that the salvation of the Lord because that's God's patience. He's waiting. He's waiting for you to make the decision to either come back to the Lord or to follow the Lord that you need to consider this time not as a waste of time. Don't get impatient. <laughs> Don't start questioning whether he will or will not. But you consider this time God's patience towards you so that when that day comes, you will be ready. I like the English Standard Version, the last part of that. It says, And the earth and its works that are done on it will be exposed. That's an older manuscript version of that. And it, the idea is exposed or discovered. Um, that's how old, older manuscripts read in that context. But Peter has also used the word destroy when he talks about the flood, right? And obviously the earth is still here. And the flood took the people away. So there's the context. There's the idea that Peter is promoting that someday the way things presently are, However, God's going to do that. I mean, you know, God has a plan. We have our theories, but God knows what's going to happen. He's going to deal with that, but he, we have to be rest assured that he's going to change it. Things are not going to be the way they always have been. Things are going to be different. The day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord will come swiftly, Peter says, like a thief in the night. It'll be sudden. It'll be unexpected. He says, at that time, the heavens will pass away with a roar. I, I don't know if I will be alive exactly when that happens, but I have a feeling it's, it's going to be amazing for those of us who belong to Jesus to see everything our suffering, our struggles, even death itself will be no more when the Lord comes to rescue his people and bring us to him, right? Look at verse 11. He says, since, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, right? Knowing this, right, knowing, knowing this is going to happen, what kind of people must we be? In, in godliness, right, in, in holy conduct, obviously. But that's the root of the question, isn't it? That's, that's the heart of this whole thing. Is that when we, we sit around and we debate about hows and whens and, and at what time and, and all these different ideas and theories we're, we're missing out on the opportunity to be godly people. We're missing out on the opportunity to be holy people. I mean, what, what, if, what if we lived in such a way that we lived in holy conduct and godliness every single moment of our lives? What if we lived in light of the expectation that the Lord's day could come at any moment? What if we actually lived that way? What if we made those kinds of sacrifices that are demanded of us to put aside worldly lusts and desires and, and fleshly desires and, and the pursuits of wealth and things like that that sometimes keep us from serving God? What if we sacrifice those things that we're comfortable with or those things that we enjoy? What if we sacrifice those things because we truly believed we truly believe that the day of the Lord could come at any moment. Here's another question. What does it say about us when we don't make those sacrifices? When we don't think about those things, when we don't live in holy conduct, when we don't live in godliness, what does it say about us in regards to whether we believe the day of the Lord is coming? What do our actions say? How do our actions communicate our, our trust and faith in God's promises? How do our actions communicate the belief that someday Jesus will return? How do our actions presently communicate to the world, to our families, to our church, to, our, to everybody, that we believe 
that God is going to keep his promise, that God is going to return to earth, that Jesus is coming back. And when he does, the heavens will be destroyed, that the heavens will be, you know, as, as it says in Isaiah, rolled up like a scroll. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? This whole idea of rolling up the heavens like a scroll. Look at verse 12. He says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Right? This whole idea where the separation between God's dwelling place, which is heaven, as we call it. Of course, in the Bible, heaven is also the sky, right? That, that's kind of the idea. But God has this dwelling place, which is heaven. We have this dwelling place, which is earth. And what is Peter promoting? He's promoting this idea that someday, those two places, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And in the whole idea in my mind is simply this, where God dwells and where we dwell will be one dwelling place. Kind of like the garden. We see that image in the garden, but that's how the Bible ends in essence. One dwelling place for God and humanity. Isn't that great? Isn't that good? A new place, not ordered exactly like the old place, right? We read through Revelation. We realize that there's not going to be any sun because why? Because the, the Father and the Son will do what? Illuminate that place, right? It's going to be a place of beauty. It's going to be a place of life. It's going to be a place of renewal. It's going to be a place without death and without sorrow and without pain. And that is what we are looking for. And that is what Peter is encouraging the brethren to look for. Look for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Right? Because all things as they are, the pain, the suffering, the death, the murder, the hatred, will be gone. And at the coming of the Lord, we will live with God. And what a beautiful image that is. But we have to truly believe it, right? We have to believe that these things are true. We have to believe that God has a new life prepared for us in a new dwelling place, a place where only righteousness dwells, so that we may live with God in peace and with one another. And if we don't believe that... We're going to be subject to any new teaching. We're going to be subject to any new idea. We're going to be subject to whatever the body desires. And Peter doesn't want that. Peter is encouraging us to live different. Verse 14, he says, Therefore, beloved, look forward to these things. Be diligent to be found by him in peace. When? When he comes back like a thief in the night, right? I mean, like right now. I mean, it totally could happen. Peter says, be found when he comes in peace, without spot and blameless, right? That needs to be not just a, an idea, not just a theory. That needs to be solidified in our hearts and our minds as a fact. And when it is, it should ultimately change our life. We have to consider Right? The reward worth the sacrifice. And, and we have to consider that the sacrifice will result in something good for the future. Folks, it's, it's hard to get excited about something that we're uncertain about. I, I have a hard time getting excited about New Year's resolutions because I have a track record of not keeping them. All right? I have a hard time getting excited about that. I have a hard time getting excited about the end goal. I have a hard time getting excited about the reward because personally, personally, I have a hard time keeping that. But I can get excited about the promises of God. I can get excited about God coming and that he will, at his coming, bring with him a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. That I can be excited about. That I can look forward to. That is what we're being encouraged to commit ourselves to. In verse 15, he says, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. 
As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all the epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, Peter says, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scripture, right? There will always be those who try to twist the scriptures. There will always be those who try to alter it and change it and, and manipulate it to their own advantage. And, and Peter says, just be aware of that. Be leery of that. Persevere through the truth. But he also says in verse 17, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, fastness, being led away with the error of wickedness. Right? Folks, the fact that God created and destroyed the world, the fact that life as we know it, will ultimately change. The fact that the faithful will live with God in a new heaven, in a new earth, should encourage us to live godly lives unless we don't believe it, unless we're not committed to it, unless we're wishy-washy about what is coming, in which case our life will reflect that kind of thinking. But in order for our lives to be changed by these truths, we have to we have to consider the reward worth the sacrifice and that the sacrifice will result in something good for the future. We have to consider the future of God, the future that God has prepared for us with him, with Jesus, worth sacrificing pleasures and desires of the present life. And folks, it is. <laughs> But we have to solidify this hope in our mind before we'll ultimately change our life. This is a, a new year. A new year. It's a time of new beginnings, but it's a new year for new commitments. And my challenge to you is to commit yourself to God. Commit yourself to Jesus. Commit yourself to being faithful. If you have not committed yourself and you have a desire to come to the truth, you have a desire to be baptized into Jesus and be born again, to start anew, this is a good opportunity for you to do that as we stand and as we sing. Would you please come forward? I